Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honour and a privilege to be asked to give this talk tonight on the St Andrews Golf Club uh, and I hope you find a, a, a bit more about the club through uh, what myself and Mike are going to be saying tonight. Fifty years ago, in toasting the St Andrews Golf Club at its anniversary dinner, Provost T.T. Fardyce stated that it was most appropriate that the toast should be the privilege of the Provost of the City because no other club had a greater claim to recognition. He said that throughout their 125 years of life, the club members had rendered to golf and to the city a service deserving the highest praise. They had helped greatly to develop in young men a love for the mastery of the game. They had also achieved outstanding success in creating friendships, the provision of recreational facilities and social amenities. The community had felt reason to express appreciation and admiration of their enterprise. On such an occasion too, he added, they did well to recall the great names in the world of golf, many of them nurtured in the club, and he went on to pay tribute to it in recognition of its contribution to the advancement of the game, not only in St Andrews but throughout the world. <coughs> no other club, he said, can claim the distinction of having so many open champions and other owners throughout the world. Your club, Mr. Captain, he concluded, has made a glorious contribution throughout 125 years to the prestige and prosperity which the city now enjoys. Long may your club continue to be of service to golfers and to uphold the traditions of St Andrews as the home of golf. The club he lavished such high praise on was founded on 23rd September 1843 when 11 men, primarily tradesmen, met and agreed to form the St Andrews Mechanics Golf Club. They were William Aiton, club maker, a cabinet maker, Alexander Bruce, cabinet maker, James Hart Mason, John Keddie Joyner, John Lynn Taylor, Adam McPherson Plasterer, James McPherson, Dancing Master, George Morris, Butler, Robert Patterson, Slater, and David Todd, Painter, who was elected as the first captain. Over the now 175 years of its existence, the club has accrued a great number of trophies, but the first trophy, which is now incorporated into the captain's badge of office, originated in 1846 when it was agreed to purchase a medal for competition twice a year. First won on New Year's Day 1847 by James Hurd with a score of 105 strokes. The club conducted its medal days in style. The New Year's Day event in 1848 was typical. <coughs> it supported that during the day the Mechanics Golf Club played for several prizes. The first was won by George Morris at 105 strokes. Very good play in any circumstances, but most extraordinary with the links covered some inches in snow. <laughs> the instrumental band, after perambulating the streets in their very handsome uniform, played up the club to Hasty's Cross Keys, where they dined and spent the evening in toast and song. <laughs> Having no premises of its own, the club met in local hostelries. However, James Howe, the secretary, had a vision for the club which he set out in his proposals for placing this club upon a more perfect and permanent basis and carrying out its objects with increased efficiency and vastly increased comfort to the whole of its members, put forward at a meeting on 9 September 1851. He proposed that they take steps to ascertain the practicability of obtaining premises, where the club meetings could be held, the clubs and playing dress of members be held, etc. The advantage of such a place for members of our club, either in point of comfort, convenience or economy, are scarcely to be calculated, and the result of having such a place would be to place us in a position that it would soon be a matter of some importance to become a member of the St Andrews Golf Club. This aspiration would not be realised for over 50 years. The long saga came to an end on 20th March 1905, when it was recorded that this day the property in Kit Place was acquired by the club. The cl last club meeting to be held in a local hostelry took place in the Golf Hotel on 9th June 1905 
and thereafter the club met in their new clubhouse. The premises were well lit by electric light and well furnished. Locker boxes were provided and from the start a wide range of reading material provided. The secretary having been instructed to order the St Andrews Citizen, Dundee Courier, Dundee Advertiser, Scotsman, Evening Telegraph and Post, Edinburgh Evening Dispatch, <laughs> Golfing Graphic, Pearson's Weekly Magazine, Strand, London and Royal. <laughs> The first drink order recorded was for a 10 gallon cask of OH whiskey from John Walker Kilmarnock. <laughs> and later the secretary was instructed to order draft beer from Messrs Younger Edinburgh, same as supplied to the Arm Day Club. <laughs> the clubhouse later extended proved a popular venue where members could relax and play billiards, dominoes, cards, push hapney and even have a bath for a fee. <laughs> It having been resolved that the charge for using the bath in the club should be four pounds per member. <laughs> By the early 1930s, the club was considering the possibility of purchasing a neighbouring property with a view to expanding the premises. This proved unsuccessful, which proved a blessing in disguise, for shortly after, Link's house came up for sale and was purchased, giving the club new premises in a prestigious location alongside the Oak Course. The formal opening of the new premises took place on 20th July 1933 and has remained the club's home ever since. While Howe's proposal for a clubhouse took decades to deliver, another of his proposals was achieved within weeks. He <coughs> stated, let the present limited name be exchanged for a more enlarged one. Instead of calling it the Mechanics Golf Club, let it be called the St Andrews Golf Club or some such comprehensive title. The result of such an alteration would be, to the, would be the admission into our club of a vast number of tradesmen and shopkeepers, which would tend to elevate us, and it would put us on a level of respectability with other golf clubs, and we would then appear alongside of them in the Fife List and Edinburgh Almanac. The name change was agreed at the AGM on 30 September 1851, at which Howie became captain of the now St Andrews Golf Club which must have given him particular satisfaction. Howie was to be succeeded as captain by the most distinguished golfer to hold the captaincy of the club when at the AGM on 15 September 1853, Mr Alan Robertson was unanimously elected captain. The club is now presided over by the monarch of golf dog, than whom none could be better qualified for being head of a golfing association. In October of that year, it was Alan Robertson who led the way at the first club ball to be recorded. An earlier version of the dinner dance of today it took place in the old town hall, which stood in Market Street, and was one which required considerable stamina. The dames and their lords, as well as the damsels and their gallants, began to arrive about nine o'clock. About 40 couples were present. And before half an hour was gone, the dancing was opened by the new captain, Mr. Alan Robertson and partner. Among others, Pop Goes the Weasel was put through its facing skillfully. About 12, the intervention of refreshment took place, after which the company resumed tripping it and continued right merrily to chase the glowing hours with flying feet until half past five, when a break-up ensued. The captain throughout the evening discharged his presidential duties with unwanted tact and assiduity, showing preeminence as well for his social qualities as for those in virtue of which he holds the title King of Clubs. Acknowledged as the greatest golfer of his age, Alan Robertson, described by his friend Tom, his friend Tom Morris as the cunningest but body of a player I think that ever handled a club, died in 1859 at the age of 44, the year before the competition for the Challenge Belt, the Open Championship, began at Presswick. Consequently, his name would never appear in the club's honours board as an open champion, but others would. Tom Morris won the challenge belt in 1861, 1862, 1864 and 1867, becoming the oldest winner of the Open. Andrew Strath won in 1865. Tom's son, Tommy Morris, succeeded his father as winner in 1868 and became the youngest winner of the Open. He went on to win again in 1869 and 1870, winning the challenge belt outright. 
There was no trophy and no competition in 1871, but by 1872 Prestwick, the Honourable Company and the RNA had worked together to purchase the Open Championship trophy we know today, which was to be contested annually on a rota of each of their courses. Tommy Morris was the first winner at Prestwick in 1872. The following year, in the first Open to be played at St Andrews, Tom Kidd won. He was followed in 1876 by Bob Martin, who, in the first playoff in Open history, had a walkover as Davy Strass refused to play while under protest. <laughs> and with wins in 1877, 1878 and 1879, Jamie Anderson became the first golfer to win the trophy on three different courses. Willie Fernley won in 1883 in a playoff with Bob Ferguson, Bob Martin for a second time in 1885, Jack Burns in 1888, Hugh Kirkcaldy in 1891, Willie Octoloni in 1893, and Sandy Hurd in 1902, who became the first player to win the Open using the new Haskell cover board ball. Jock Hutchison, who had been born in the Ladyhead, the Fisherman's Quarter in St Andrews, and moved to the USA as a golf professional, became the first American citizen to win the Open in 1921. And in 1978, the year he had been made an honorary member of the club, Jack Nicholas won the title. There were wins two in the Amateur Championship in 1893 for P.C. Anderson, the son of the Minister of the Second Charge at Holy Trinity Church, and in 1906 for James Rowe. Success came in the, in the United States where the Open Championship was won by James Fowlis in 1896, Fred Hurd in 1898, Laurie Octorloni in 1902 who became the first golfer to break 80 in all four rounds in the Championship and the first to win using a Haskell ball and Jack Nicklaus in 1980. Finlay S. Douglas who was to become President of the US Golf Association in 1929-30 won the US Amateur in 1898 and Jock Hutchison, the US PGA Championship in 1920. Quite a record. <coughs> While a chosen few have distinguished themselves in major championships at home and abroad, the majority of members have been happy to enjoy their golf in competition with fellow members and with those from other clubs in the many inter-club matches which have evolved over the years, through which many long-term friendships have developed. The first of these took place against Leaving Golf Club, at Leaven on 5th November 1849, when it was reported that the club paid to each player a sum of two shillings towards their expenses at the match. Six members represented each club, but about 20 went down to Leaven. But neither Alan Robertson or Tom Morris was in the team, as the club thought they were strong enough without the assistance of the cracks. It was a great day for St Andrews who won by 19 holes to two and the social gathering which followed was a fitting finish to an auspicious occasion. It was bright moonlight when the team left leaving and the journey soon passed, but the victors were hardly prepared for the welcome they got when they reached home. Practically every member who had stayed at home waited for them, besides many others, and gave the triumphant golfers a right royal welcome. Among the many ties the club has built up over the years, two of the longest standing are with Carnoustie first played in 1873 and Leaven Thistle first played in 1884, from which developed the three corner match for the Lindsay Show, which my colleague Mike Chesler will speak on later. The greatest challenge match the club faced came with the home and home matches against Forfordshire, which took place in June and August 1897. It was reported that to understand the task set the St Andrews golfers, it is only sufficient to mention that the membership of the club was less than 100, 94 to be exact, while Forfordshire, with 23 clubs, had about 4,000 players to choose from. The teams were 25 <coughs> players aside, which thus represented over 25% of the St Andrews club and only about three-fifths of 1% of Forfordshire. Despite the odds, the St Andrews Golf Club won a famous victory. At the highest level, club members have played, in Great Britain, played for Great Britain and Ireland in the Walker Cup and Ryder Cup matches against the USA. At amateur level, John Cavan played in the first ever Walker Cup match in 1922, 
And Scott MacDonald was a member of the Great Britain and Ireland team, captained by Michael Benalek, who later became an honorary member of the St Andrews Golf Club, which won the Walker Cup in a match over the old course, defeating America for the first time since 1938. And at professional level, Laurie Aiden Jr. was in the team for the Ryder Cup in 1949, and George Will played in, 18, in 1963, 1965, and 1967. Young players are the future of the game, and the St Andrews Golf Club has had a long history of encouraging juniors and juveniles in developing their skills and understanding the etiquette of the game. The earliest recorded involvement of the club in promoting the game amongst the boys in the town came when it undertook to organise a competition for the medal that had been presented to the club in 1900 by G.C. Douglas, J.P., for competition amongst the youths of St Andrews. The first competition for the Douglas medal took place on 28 June 1900, where it was won by William Simpson, apprentice club maker, with a score of 86. Over the years, a number of trophies have been presented to the club for competition between junior and juvenile members and a series of inter-club matches arranged, played annually, such as the junior recovery of the Lindsay Shield, the Joe Gurley Trophy, contested between juniors from the clubs which contest the Lindsay Shield. Some young players have gone on to enjoy success in national championships at Scottish and British level, starting with Ian MacDonald, who won the British Boys Amateur in 1932, and continuing through George Bull, Lachlan Carver, Alex Souter, Scott MacDonald, James Bunch, Fraser Ogston, Ewan Scott and Ben Kinsley to Will Porter who won the Scottish Boys Championship in 2015 and Jimmy Savage at the age of 19 won the Irish Amateur. And it's now 175 years of existence that St Andrews Golf Club has been home to players of all abilities and backgrounds and continues to play an important role in developing young players. It is a much-loved institution which has constantly adapted its facilities to meet the changing expectations of members and could, can look forward with confidence to the future. The toast proposed by Provis for Dice back in 1968, long may your club continue to be of service to golfers and to uphold the traditions of St Andrews as the home of golf is as relevant today as the club celebrates its 175th anniversary as it was back then. It was and remains an institution of which both club members and the town as a whole can be proud. through here in 1982, and I'd never played the old for donkeys. Tonight like this, walking up the 18 with these pools of shadows, and we got around in three hours, but <laughs> and I thought, it can't get any better than this. And then I was invited into St. Anne's Gospel, and you go in and you think, what a history. And Keith's outlined all these golfing grades that are part and parcel of our club. Now, they're part of the rich tapestry, but they're not just, it's not just them. The weft and weave is more than that. Now, they are maybe the golden threads, but for me, I'm trying, what I'm going to try and do is to sum up the spirit of the club by looking at an individual, a family, and a trophy. Now, if you go into the club, on the left-hand side, you will see the captain's board. And in 1912, there was a guy called David Leach who was captain. Now, Graham's been out. He's a fast captain. Steve's a fast captain. There's nobody more fast than a fast captain. <laughs> 50, 40 years from now, these names, mine included, in fact, probably five years from now, will be absolutely meaningless. And this guy, David Leach, is just the name on the board. Until you did. And one of his relatives is sitting here, or descendants rather, Jim Bennett. Now, he was born in North Street in 1858. Now, think about it. 
I think that's about three, maybe four years before the start of the American Civil War. It's extraordinary to think that. Now, America was just a young country then. And this guy was playing golf, and he was a baker. And he left and became a foreman baker in Leith, and then a wine and spirit merchant. And what's intriguing about it is, he then bought pubs, including what was the Mason Arms, which is now the Central Bar. And if you go up to the Central Bar, and I've got no shares in the bar, so <laughs> <laughs> I have to rush up there. You'll see on the wall, it used to be a wooden plaque, and it had his name on it. I think it's now a plasticized thing, but his name is still there. And he married really well, I believe. Uh, because I think his first pubs were in Musselburgh. And the interesting thing was, he was an office bearer in these clubs. Now, Onestas or Onestas is interesting because it was in Musselburgh. And if you, if you know Musselburgh, you know it's called the Honest Two. And Onestas is in the coat of arms. And bizarrely, his great great grandson, Dennis, phoned me up the day job about three, four hours ago. And I asked him, what is this Onestas? And it turned out to be a drinking club within the Musselburgh Golf Club. So as a St. Andrean, he would have felt fully at home. <laughs> and he was captain of our club in 1912. But his great, or one of his great claims to fame was he helped define amateur status. Because up until about 1896, I think it was, there was an awful lot of local rules. And then I think there was a, a grand conference down at um, Sandwich. And the RMA then became the, you know, the final arbiter and the rule maker. And he fell foul because he won a competition as a young amateur. And it, he was, it was contested because it was claimed he was a professional. And the basis of the complaint was that after school, he came down to the links and carried clubs, caddied, and got paid for it. So they altered the rules that is, you know, so that young guys could carry. And there must be an awful lot of St. Andreas over the past hundred more years that have been truly grateful for that. We'll come back to the caddy thing later. Um, but he was a crap golfer. And he traveled all over. I mean, this guy, Dennis Leach, has a suitcase of you know, newspaper cuttings and filings of these guys. He played in Hoylake, he played with Lolly Octoloni, he played with all of these guys. Now, this is a professional tournament. In truth, well, it's not, because of the light, it's not very good. That's David Leach there. That is an Aiton, David Aiton. And all of these guys were professionals apart from the invited amateurs. And David Leach was one of them. Now, can you imagine that? You know, I don't think that could be replicated today. Maybe I'm wrong. And he came back to St. Andrews, and he actually remained, he lived still in Edinburgh for a long time during his captaincy, and he traveled to the meetings and fulfilled his duties. And this was about the time that the Fourth Road Bridge was built. The rail bridge. Did I say road? <laughs> the radio group slipped it. Uh, and so travel wasn't very easy. And here's an encouragement to everybody looking here. I mean, I don't know what the average is you see it. Probably 41. <laughs> <laughs> but he kept, he kept on playing right up to his 78th year. And age 76, he played in the Eden Tournament. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. But the thing about him is that when he died, it was about the cusp when the game began to change. Prior to then, it was more or less dominated by Scottish artisan golfers. And if you think of this huge diaspora, you know, from Dornick you know, all the way through to the Lothians, of folk emigrating and taking the game over. And that was, that was a, a really interesting change. And he was part of that elite group of golfers. And for me, it's guys like that that are fundamental to the history of this golf club. And what I suspect is, if you pick anybody else on that captain's board, 
or any other member, they probably have a backstory which would be as interesting and as illuminating as that. Now, in terms of the family, you could have picked the herds, you could have picked the Ortolones. In fact, the herd thing is interesting because David here, we used to work with a guy called a psychologist called Hamish McPhee, and it turns out that he's related to the herds on his mother's side. Unfortunately, the golfing gene hasn't passed through to him. <laughs> <laughs> so I gather, I gather these follow throughs like a coup game do for the neck. <laughs> the Naya said that. But the family I've chosen are the Aitens. Now, at this point, I'd like to play a tribute to Nancy Aiden. I don't know if many of you know Nancy. Nancy's a lovely, lovely uh, woman. And so everything that you're going to see is a has been gleaned from her. I knew Willie, her husband, quite well. There's a wee bit of tragic story there. <coughs> it was two years ago, he knew we were involved. Keith and I were doing all of this stuff. Primarily Keith, by the way. Um, in fact, almost exclusively Keith, by the way. Uh, so he can answer all the questions. <laughs> uh, but the, Willie, before Christmas two years ago, he knew, he, he knew we were interested in this. And he said, I've got stuff to give you. Could you come and see me? But wait till after Christmas. Because I'm not feeling well. Unfortunately, he died. Uh, but Nancy stepped into the breach. Now, this family has an astonishing record of service to the club. Willie Aiton Sr. was a ship's carpenter and he fought at the. Well, he not fought, I suppose he did. He was at the Battle of Trafalgar. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. You know, that's a kiss we are to you. It was a kiss to you, know, you know, that thing. And, he was a, a, a ship's carpenter, and 170 years later, Laurie had this, you know, was a captain as well. It's amazing. But this gentleman here is Willie Eaton Jr. And he served for a, a total of, I think it was 15 years, spread over three decades. It's an extraordinary electric service. And I think that's, it should be an inspiration to us all. I mean, I've lost count of the amount of uh, you know, clubs that you go around and institutions that they meet that are dying on their feet because they can't get uh, you know, service. It's extraordinary. But look at them. That is not, well, that is not a golf club. It's a rifle. <laughs> He's a crack shot. And Nancy has these two little they look like buttons. And at first we thought they were you know, golfing uh, you know, winnings. Is that a winner? One or something. They're shooting trophies. It's amazing. And look at the mutton chops. <laughs> well, you know, and he's serious. <laughs> and this is David Aid, you know, to continue the line. Now, he was a caddy. And there's his caddy badge, a little metal badge, which he had to wear at all times. And at that time, if he transgressed, you got a punishment. If you were inebriated, I think it was significant, not a fine, but it was significantly more. Now, he apparently aged 17 to beat the Jimmy Anderson in a money match. Amazing! He was a professional, but the thing was, caddying was in his blood. And he gave it all up to caddy for the rest of his life. It's extraordinary. But look at the way he's dressed. Oh, wait a minute, this thing. Is there a red light there? Oh, what matter? I love that. Now, if you if you contrast that with the caddies now, you know, they're high vis vests and they're five and a half hour rounds. <laughs> I, mean, I bet you he sped round with them. Just extraordinary. And these are the really famous ones, you know. And that's taken outside our club. And look at them. And these were the days for the always wore a tie. My father, if he was a gardener, would wear a tie. Pat's father, if he was working on the car, would wear a tie. It's just a lovely picture. Now, Laurie, in his younger day, was a plus six handicap. I just can't get my head around that. You know, you hand him a score and they add on six. I just find it absolutely unbelievable. And he played at the time with these guys, and he was considered to be the top ten. And he'd lots of... Um, you know, credible, uh, you know, open, uh, you know, how could he put it, successes. But he was beaten in 1920 by Jock Hutchison. And this is the other interesting thing about our golf club. 
It's the interweaving and the connections between all these people that have given so much to the, you know, the history of the game. And this guy, you know, John Henry, I think it's John Henry, isn't it, Taylor? You know, one of the, the golfers of his day, he wrote that about it. A stylish long hitter and one of the best exponents of the delicate run-up shot to them. Now that rang through my head as a thin through the green on the first <laughs> Tuesday night. <laughs> Alec, the one in the centre, again a professional, and he gifted the, the Aiden Trophy. And if you're a club member, you'll know about the Aiden Trophy. If you're not, get in touch with the club member and go in and see it. David, who was again an accomplished golfer, but he gave back to the game by teaching. Now I can remember, how many people here knew Graham Duncan? Graham claims he was taught by him when he first came through here. And his abiding memory was that he was a bit of a flying elbow and he felt a swash. <laughs> and it was a hickory hitting him to see, you don't need fly your elbow or whatever. <laughs> and we've got a very good picture in Keith's book of him looking almost the same as that, quite severe. I mean, have you noticed a family resemblance? They all look like each other by the way, um, in the club, because in the 1950s, in what's now the restaurant, they used to put up practice nets there, and he would go down, and they would hit balls, and he would coach them, and all that sort of stuff. But he was enormously respected, and that parade in 1946, at the time, was a huge event. And so there he was, a club member, representing the club. And he passed on his golfing skills, of course, to uh, Laurie Eaton Jr. were very heard about through Keith, so I'll skip over that. Now the trophy, that's the family. And there could be lots of other families of the pick, I think, that would show what our club is like. The trophy is the Lindsay Shield. Now, arguably, it's the it must be one of the oldest triangular matches in the world, and as you know, it's played between these three famous clubs, and you have to be a damn good golfer to get it. Uh, it's usually for golfers, or for Carusti, I think, in particular, in the past, have, have played professionals. We have as well, but not to the same, same extent. This photograph is an interesting one. Oh, sorry. I can't get the red button. Well, here it is, isn't it? Yeah. See him there? That's Aiden Jr. Remember the red jacket? That's him. And if you look, you see... This is an There it is. The cat and the mutton chops. This guy is a Lorimer. J. Lorimer. And there was a shop in North Street, Cross Street in Lorimer, who were golf club makers and whatnot, he was linked to them. But there's another interesting link to the Lindsay Shield that you'll get in a minute. But isn't that what an amazing picture? This guy, I hope he didn't play in that. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he did. I suspect that he's the driver. <laughs> Unless he was whipping them in the shape. <laughs> uh, and the, oh, you can't see it, but the, the footwear. And, and in the book, uh, there are some terrific pictures. We've got a cracker from the USPGA of uh, D.R. Forgan playing in his adopted country, America, against Canada. It's an absolute picture for you. Now, the book will be on sales, big sales picture, John. <laughs> but it's through members, it's through the club. So if you really want one, you better befriend a member. Now, in 1953, it was formalised into what became, or what is now rather, the Lindsay Shield. And it was gifted by this guy, Joe Lindsay, in memory of his father, who was a professional golfer. Now again, all these interlocking stuff, because he was a crack golfer. He got an honours degree in geology, as you can read there. But he won the, the, the boy Quake in 1948. And I think the Boyd Quake was inaugurated in 1947. And I think for the first one he was run up. He was some golfer. Uh, and he made a career in the oil industry, especially in Venezuela. Uh, God knows what he'd make him a duo. Probably got the same equipment now. But, never mind. but it was in memory of his father 
And that is a threat. He could be auditioning for the great Gatsby. I mean, the slick hair. And he was a professional. But it just goes to show that the professional game is not just for guys that track the course. He was an outstanding groundsman by all the guys. And he laid out his courses. But he came back here and then became a, a licensed professional teaching the game as well. And that is Kenny Lindsay. You know Kenny? And his father had married, or sorry, his grandfather had married a Lorimer. And that was a connection with that photograph that we saw of the team. That guy, Jay Lorimer, was connected to his wife. It's an extraordinary thing. Now, I suspect that 1,500 years ago, Somebody like me standing up at Haven and looking back to this group, no, the current group, might not have that type of connection. Things are changing rapidly. And all of that is symptomatic of an era within a golf club. And I mentioned the thing about the tapestry. That is the richness of the tapestry. You'll know there that's the late uh, Mr. Sturrock on the, the right. You'll know Billy Dunn. Uh, that was at the, I think it was the 40th anniversary, which coincided with the 40th, 50th anniversary, if I remember right. And it was a joint celebration. So, we'll leave here, get into the club if you're no a member, drink it all in, and remember, the title of this book, St. Andrews Forever.